Welcome back to our channel. Please be reminded that this video does not reflect on any opinions from the DC team and is only published for information purposes. Video courtesy of Learning Events Series, Facebook page. Please check our video description for link. An online lecture was given by Attorney Golda Benjamin, a Dumaguete resident, regarding the legal dimensions of the Dumaguete Smart City Reclamation Project. This was held via Zoom and Facebook Live on July 29, 2021. Good evening. Uh, thank you for joining us again for another um, session of uh, this learning event series. And we'd like to welcome everyone to uh, Learning Event Series 3.0. Uh, tonight, we're going to be talking about the legal dimensions uh, of the Dumaguete Reclamation Project. But before that, uh, I hope everyone has read the house rules. We apologize for the slight delay today. We had some technical difficulties, uh, but everything has been fixed and uh, we hope to emphasize though that uh, tonight we will be taking questions not just on zoom but also on fb live so if you have any questions you can type your questions in at the q a box here on zoom or on fb live we have a team that will collect the questions and we will be answering them or our speaker will be answering them at the end of tonight's talk. All right, uh, this learning event series would not have been possible without the Dumaguete City Host Lions Club and the Rotary Club of Dumaguete South. We would like to thank you for making possible uh, this gathering where we could learn a little bit more about the issues surrounding the Dumaguete Reclamation Project and dig a little bit deeper, more than just the sound bites. Uh, we, we get to, you know, thresh out the details a little bit more. Uh, tonight, we're going to be hearing from Attorney Golda Benjamin. She obtained her law degree from the University of the Philippines and is a practicing lawyer as well as a current professor at the SU College of Law. She is also the program director at the Business and Human Rights Resource Center, an international nonprofit organization based in London, England. Let's listen to her insights on the legal dimensions of the proposed reclamation project. Hello, Attorney Benjamin. Thank you, Attorney Sarah. Good evening, everyone. I'm just going to put up my slides, and I'd like to get a confirmation as soon as my slides are up. How are you, Zara? Good, good. I can't, it's, uh, it still says host disabled participant sharing. I think right. our IT I, will I, I be helping. Okay. I see it now and I just need a confirmation if I'm see, you're seeing the slides now on the screen. I'm seeing it on the screen. All right, I'm gonna put it on uh, presentation mode. Now. Okay. All right, is it? Does it fit well in the screen? Is it all right? Yes, it fits well. All right, I'll start now. Good evening again, everyone. The title of my presentation tonight is Politicians' Promises, the 174-hectare unsolicited reclamation project, and of course, the law. So in terms of the sequence, the flow of my, dis my discussion tonight, I'm going to start with some broad strokes discussion on progress and development for the Dumaguete, some ideas. Um, I decided to start with this because I've been hearing that those who oppose this project are anti-development. And I'd like to correct that impression. We are not anti-development. Uh, the second part of my presentation is just an explanation and a review, especially those who have not had the chance to wa watch the council hearing. So I'm going to describe exactly how we, the people of Dumaguete, were deprived of our right to be heard. And then, of course, uh, because I've been tasked to do a legal discussion, I'm going to discuss why this is a corrupt contract. 
under the definitions of our law. And of course, I'll end with what can be done. So I'll start now. There's, I know a lot of things for sure in my life. And the statement on the screen today is one of those things. I believe that we don't need an unsolicited reclaimed island to bring more progress and development to Dumaguete City. I know that for sure. And these are some of the development goals that I think a good city, city should have. There are eight, but I'd like to invite everyone to the three points where I placed check marks. I think a city can generate jobs or we should believe that a city can generate jobs if we are able to promote it as an investment destination for commerce, trade, and for Dumaguete City, there's potential for us to be a business process outsourcing hub for the country, especially because we are a university town. We have the talent to actually have diverse business process outsourcing services, not just invoice facilities, but also even in terms of high level uh, services like architecture, even the law, legal review, and all these kinds of in investments. Number six, I also believe that if you want to have a progressive city, we all need to have transparency and responsible community participation in governance. We always hear it even in local and international events that we need to co-shape the future of our city. And finally, one of the development goals of a progressive and well-developed city is to sustain and maximize utilization of what we have, land and resources, in a manner that will protect the environmental integrity of the city. So I don't understand why we have to force a project that destroys, that unavoidably and undeniably will destroy so much of our natural resources when we have alternatives. And so some of the, the more specific things, so the more specific ideas. So I'll just discuss three. On tourism, because Dumaguete is, is growing to be a tourism hub, we can actually go and adopt modern marketing technology to pull in visitors to our city. We can develop highly skilled livelihood communities to support the tourism infrastructure. On governance, again, we can strengthen CSO participation. We can comply with the Anti-Red Tape Act so that our businesses are able to transact in a fast and efficient manner. And finally, for investment and revenue, of course, we have to improve and modernize our tax collection systems. We do massive and aggressive investment promotion uh, activities, and then we can also build the dream of really building high-scale, high-level BPO centers and try to aim to become one of the top 10 BPO hubs in the country. But before you mistake me for presenting a platform for a political position, I just want to correct that. These were actually Mayor Emolio's plans and promises to us, signed, budgeted in the 2017-2023 Dumaguete City Comprehensive Development Plan. Those are his plans, not mine. And after four years, what happened? Does our mayor feel that he has failed his people, that he has actually failed to deliver on his comprehensive development plan? And just a fun trivia, if you do a simple control F of this CDP, you can't find reclamation. The word reclamation does not appear there. I looked at our disaster risk and management uh, plan also of the city, and I was very sad because one of the goals even of that plan also by Mayor Remolio, again signed by Mayor, Mayor Remolio, says that one of his goals is to actually increase coral production. Awkward word for the scientist in the room today, but he wanted to increase coral production. So again, my question is, after four years, what happened? But of course, I'm trained in the law and I'm now going to jump into the law. So again, as a matter of review, all PPP contracts that the city mayor will enter into must go through prior authorization by our, by our city council. And that will come in the form of a resolution. So any contract that the city mayor will enter into, he needs the consent or the authorization of the Sangunian. Under our PPP ordinance, it has to be in the form of a resolution. But our PPP ordinance also has a big clause that during the consideration of this particular PPP contract, 
by the sambunian, a public consultation or hearing must be conducted. And after sufficient and enough hearing out of the public, then that's when the mayor can go to the private sector proponent and then sign the contract. And then the third step is for the mayor to go back to the city council. Because as we remember, at least I, I see a lot of lawyers and law students in the room, the city council serves as the check and balance of the, ex the extreme power, the magnitude of the power of the mayor. So he goes back to his city council, presents the, the contract now signed, and then tells the council, can you please approve or affirm the terms and provisions of this contract? At that point, we can no longer amend the contract because remember, we have a private sector partner in this case. Um, I mentioned um, in, in one of my talks that we can amend, but it's very, 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 the margin is very, very slim. It's only if the amendment is not going to substantially change the nature of the contract. But even if we amend, we again need to get authorization, we again need to go back to our private sector proponent, and then we, need, we again need to go back to the council to have an, an affirmation by an ordinance. So it's quite clear. Um, this provision is not even vague, it's very clear. But the question now is, how were they able to force the city council to skip public hearing? But I'd like to clarify first, because the mayor seems to be promoting this narrative that there's nothing to worry about, that we are alarmist because the DENR and the PRA will still conduct consultations. That is correct. But his mistake is he forgot that under the law, there are actually two major consultations that should happen. Consultation number one is when the draft PPP contract is presented to the council. And who has the duty to consult? It's the city council. So even his info drive, which um, there seems to be a flip-flopping. I've been following their press releases. He, sometimes they call it consultation, sometimes an info drive. But definitely that info drive is not the consultation provided for in our law because the duty rests on the city council. And these nice expensive info drives are actually being done by the mayor. And I think uh, based on the pictures today by Councillor uh, Ramon as well. So that's a requirement in the law. And then when the city decides that yes, EM Cuerpo is the company that we want to deal with, we think it is qualified, it has excellent experience in reclamation. Yes, we believe in reclamation as the way to go for progress and development in the city. Then the council may approve uh, and give the mayor the authority to sign the joint venture agreement. And then consultation number two, based on various laws, it is when the city will apply for an ECC with the DENR. But common sense will tell us that the consultation in the DENR will, of course, focus on just the environmental concerns, not the constitutional problems, not the issues on whether or not this private sector component submitted complete materials, not whether or not the private sector proponent is financially capable to actually execute a $23 billion contract. So to be able to really promote this narrative, this incomplete, inaccurate narrative is also a form of deception, which is actually a bad sign of a leader. And I will not, I will not stay silent if they want to do that. This is what they think they can get away with. They think that they can hide and they can block consultations at the city council level because anyway, we're still going to the DENR for consultation. That has no basis in law. And it has no basis in fundamental principles of good governance. And that's why we should protest. Next, there seems to be a misunderstanding. And before this talk, I really took a moment to listen to the entire video of uh, Mayor Remolio when he was speaking to the scholars in our, in our um, city. And I think, I may be wrong, I think they feel that a joint venture agreement is not a PPP contract. So I'd like to explain this. Under our, our PPP ordinance, there are several types of PPP contracts that we can enter into. And that's why it's called PPP modalities. How do we intend to have a relationship with the private sector? It could be through a build and transfer agreement with a company. 
it could be a rehabilitate and transfer agreement with a company, and yes, it can be a joint venture agreement. So when the ordinance and all the other related laws talk about a draft PPP contract, they could be talking about a draft joint venture contract, a draft BOT contract, or a draft lease contract. That's the kinds of PPP co uh, contracts that are allowed under the law. So when they say there's no PPP contract, there's just a MOA, that's just really, for lack of a better and nicer term, ridiculous. Next, even if we look at the resolution signed by our own PPP selection committee, when they recommended the award of this contract, they also mentioned the term this joint venture agreement shall be signed within five calendar days from the issuance of a resolution authorizing the mayor to sign the joint venture agreement. Not a MOA, not an MOU, but a joint venture agreement. So they're done with this stage, okay? And that was what exactly our council did. They authorized the mayor to sign this joint venture agreement. And they got away with it only because the transmittal letter says attached are copies of the memorandum of agreement signed by our city legal officer, attorney Manuel Arbon, and our city mayor, also an attorney. But if you look at the attached document, even the title alone will tell us that this is the draft joint venture agreement. Because when the private sector uh, proponent presents an unsolicited proposal, they need to attach under the law a draft JVA or whatever PPP contract they want to present to the city. So this was submitted, proposed as a JVA, negotiated as a JVA, awarded as a JVA based on the resolution of the PPP SC, and then sent, sent to the city council as a JVA. Again, in my presentation, I looked at the entire document 11 times. The phrase joint venture agreement was mentioned. The phrase memorandum of agreement, zero. Okay, it only appears when it talks about the MOU or the MOA that will later on be, be um, entered into when the city does decide to apply for reclamation. So again, I, I just, when I was watching the hearing, I couldn't believe it. It's like a blind leading the blind, people voting on something that is obviously incorrect. And the, the document was also incomplete because section two of this document enumerates annex, annex documents like the feasibility study, subcontractor agreements, which ideally the private sector pro proponent or EM Cuerpo should have attached to their unsolicited proposal. Because that's how, how the city evaluates whether or not this company is legit. It was not even attached. And I think even if mangutang taog 1,000 pesos, yan niingon nga muni akong ato ang evidence of of the utang sa 1,000, and ay niingon nga in Annex A, I think not even you don't even need to be a lawyer. Your first question is, where is the Annex A? But again, our city council, out of gross neglect of duty, didn't even dare ask, where are the other evidence? Uh, the other documents. So it's really quite sad also for Dumaguete. When I was watching the hearing, it was a moment of shame for me. Naulaw ko sa akong mga kaila na nagtanaw tanan. And I have to remind everyone, and I'd like to thank um, the Salonga Center, I'd like to remind everyone that AMOA with EM Cuerpo is not even required to start the Philippine Reclamation Authority process. The city just needs a letter of intent, a council resolution expressing no objection to the proposed reclamation project. This also has the condition that the city already went through extensive public consultation. At least the mayor lost that in earlier hearings by virtue of a motion, I think, by Councillor Arbas. And then a resolution from the council authorizing the LGU to file an application with the PRA. When the city faces PRA, and it is in a joint agreement that it is the city only that will be the proponent of the reclamation application, it cannot and should not bring the EM Cuerpo documents. 
So my question now from a common sense and a legal perspective is, why are we so adamant? Why are we not withdrawing the authority of the mayor to sign this beast called a memorandum of agreement invented through a transmittal letter by our legal officer and our mayor, who is a lawyer? Why are we insisting on that when it's not required in the Philippine Reclamation Authority rules? So it's really curious why they're trying to do that. My next question is, why is this joint venture agreement a corrupt contract? And I'd like to clarify that corruption has several phases in the law, in our Philippine law. It's not just the typical bringing money to the house uh, of a politician in the dead of the night. It's not that. A JVA or a contract can be corrupt if, for example, you award it to an entity, a company that is not qualified to do the work. It's corrupt because it will endanger your people. They're gonna reclaim for three years and wala sila na hibalan ani nga negosyo. Even if my uh, akong gripo dere madaot sa balay, dili ko nagway na ko suguon ang usaka kuan ang akong bana nga architect. Di ba siya kabalo magayu o gripo? At least he tries, uh, but usahay mo surrender siya. Kay patabang gid siya o plumber, someone who's trained for that. So even common sense alone will explain to us why the law makes that a corrupt contract. Secondly, the law also makes it corrupt when the government enters into a contract that is grossly disadvantageous to the government and also when the government actually manifestly favors, without reason, favors a particular supplier. And usually based on our jurisprudence and volunteer lawyers are already compiling the cases decided both by the uh, Supreme Court and the Sandigan Bayan, the badges of this kind of corrupt action is when the government officials make shortcuts. So for example, they award a contract even if the documents are incomplete, they award the contract by, by, by skipping so many steps. The jurisprudence is already rich and it's very concerning because again, our city council is packed with lawyers, the PPP selection committee is packed well, at least has two lawyers based on what I see on the document that we have so far. So why again is EM Puerpo not qualified? First, we are sure that EM Puerpo is not a reclamation company. Classic procurement, the first thing you're going to ask if a corporation is applying for something or a government contract, you go through to their securities and exchange commission documents. And if you look at that, they even amended it in 2018 there's no reclamation. If you look at their own website, they have no reclamation experience. Now, just today, breaking news, I finally got a copy of our Swiss challenge ad. This is when we say, we have EM Cuerpo now, and we think EM Cuerpo is qualified, but because we are trying to find a better deal, we're going to publish it in the newspaper so that other companies can outbid. EM Cuerpo. This is from the newspaper. They cannot deny this anymore because so we just got a copy. It's, a, it's an official copy. One of the major points from the Swiss, ad, uh, Swiss challenge ad is that the private sector proponent must have completed similar or related projects. And we know that EM Cuerpo has not done that. And so we go to 4.2 because private sector proponents are also allowed to collaborate. Kana na siya subcontractor, pwede siyang work with other companies, but our own ad says that this each member of the collaboration must be disclosed during the pre-qualification stage. So kung naa kay kauban, kay dili dai ni mukaya ang reclamation component, dapat imo siyang i-disclose. And in this project, nang promise pa sila og mga yacht club, mga helipad dapat ilagay ng i-prove nga makabukat pit sila ana. And even if, and so it, it has to be disclosed during the pre-qualification stage. So that brings us to the question, if EM Cuerpo is not a reclamation company, is it then true that they have a Chinese partner that is verified from their records in the stock, uh, in the stock exchange of Hong Kong, they are among many other businesses, a reclamation company. But in the Philippines, they are not registered in the Securities and Exchange Commission. 
they are not they do not have a PCAB license and our joint venture agreement requires them even to have a PCAB license. Another disturbing fact is that this Polichanda apparently entered into a memorandum of understanding with EM Cuerpo as early as 2019. It was the company that actually offered to assist and submit a proposal to EMCI, EM Cuerpo. Sila ang may offer nga, uy, kami buwat sa inyong reclamation. And of EM Cuerpo agreed. It makes sense. Common sense, it, it agreed, of course, because bilik man sila reclamation company. But they only submitted in November 2019. So the premise here is that Polichanga already knew about Dumaguete. We have been scoped by this Polichanga. They found a company in the Philippines, a tiny one, definitely not able to execute the 23 billion contract, and then proceeded to, in my guess, probably write the entire thing, write the entire proposal. And I'm not going to go through the national security implications because I don't have time. I'm going to go through um, whether or not they can afford. So I've already presented this in the council. The, the contract is 23 billion. The net worth of the company is only 1.4 billion. I've asked ba uh, bankers of some of the biggest banks in the Philippines. I've asked so far five. And they said that based on the FS, they're definitely not going to lend uh, 23 billion to this company. It's just not possible based on their FS. And I hope the city council would have the humility to actually bring in bankers to testify on this issue or actually to start by asking the members of the PPP selection committee to explain how did Cuerpo justify that they can fund this project. And if you look at, if you look at this slide, they promised the heavens to Dumaguete. Roland Reclamation, I've asked big reclamation companies na matino diri sa Pilipinas, their costing is 70,000 per square meter. So, kanang mga bright diri of math, alayon lang kung compute. It's 70,000 per square meter. We are reclaiming 174 hectares of land. Okay? Aside from that, they promised so many things. Wastewater, Esplanade, Perry Port. And they also promised to build so many things under horizontal developments. What is curious is that the mayor is saying that this project also includes protection sa mga dagpong balud sa tinago kay sige na gibagyo ang tinago. But if you look at the project cost, it actually does not include the environmental protection component, shoreline protection, and kaning nasa bottom sa atong slide. Of course, there could be an argument. They can say, oh, if all na diya sa similar facili facilities, ay pwede na ibutang diri sa facilities. But we know if we're drafting a contract and bilik talay hang mauwat sa atong ka-partner, may ingon ta, oh, kung ingon na siyang i-support, kani nga imong dipang promise na environmental protection, di ibutang na lista. Anyway, nagbutang naman ka daag lista, di ibutang daan. Making it very broad is legally risky because the company can argue up to the Supreme Court and up to God that that is not covered by the project cost. So again, gross neglect of duty on the part of the city council when they refused to really do the enough due diligence in relation to this contract. And that's why I'm angry because this is also very embarrassing for the city. This is our first major PPP contract. And in all the international reports on investor, uh, investor behavior, one of the major factors that turn off investors is instability in government and corruption. Investors don't want to deal with governments. No, like claro. And if we continue doing this, and we're already on national media, it just attracts the sleazy type of invest investors. Katong mga tarong na investors, di na mungikap sa dumagete, kay pataka-taka ng dumagete, hadlok na kay sila, kay what if ma national media na kay sila. In terms of land sharing, 51% will go to the government. But the government share will be divided. 60% will go to PRA. The rest will go to the city. But Dumaguete also agreed that the 30% for roads and open spaces, which a total of 52.2 hectares, will be taken out only from its share, 
wala gani siya ni ingon ni empower po nga pahinon po ligoy nato ni dako biya kay ning 52 hectares magama patag wastewater treatment niya ang butog unsa kadako pila ka hectare pud na inyo hang buhaton man ng wastewater treatment so, so again you really see that whose interests are we serving here are we serving the interests of the city of Dumaguete or this private proponent just because they're waiving 23 billion worth of investments on ancillary shares they said, or, or the joint venture agreement says that we are going to get 25% net share, which is good. Okay, which is good. 25% pwede na. Okay, pwede na karon kanang makalma na ko, opera ko 25%. Sige. But look at the ancillary businesses that we agreed to. Asa man ang taon, ana ang million million ang kita. Potentially wireless communication, but I'm not sure if it's the business itself or the infrastructure. Potentially, geriatric center if it is the saucy type of hospitals for old sick people. I don't know. And because we don't have the documents, we don't know the financial projection of this project. And I even shared to a few people that even the term net share, because it is not defined in our joint venture agreement, later on, maka problema pata. I'm involved in a small arbitration case because I do international commercial ar arbitration on the side. And that's precisely one of the issues raised by the company. They said, net share will only start to kick in once we recover everything we invested. We invested into this project. Usa pa daw magsugod ang net share pintahanay. So if there are already definitions under the law or in, in some other accounting practice, put it in the contract. Otherwise, you put Dumaguete in economic danger. Malugita. Next, on the jobs. Sige magigug ka dumug ani. And it is normal for a mayor to have all the politicians' typical promises. Jobs, jobs, jobs. But under our joint venture agreement, it's not true. It's not true, despite what the mayor said in one info drive na, dumagete brasa din sa yun puno tanan. The language is priority in hiring of manpower. And we know that that provision already exists in our national law. But we have investments in Manila, matibuok building, puros insik ang man. Okay? And we know that that's very difficult to find remedies. You can't just let this 23 billion company come in, build for three years, destroy our marine protected areas, and then say, oh, you're not hiring all Dumaguete, so I'm going to kick you out, or I'm going to end the contract. Come on, let's be realistic. Okay, magdambo na tango, mahitabo na, di na mahitabo. There's also no remedy mechanism in the law, except for rescission, which is undang ta sa contract, which we know will not happen, 100%. Sure ko, anak, di na mahitabo. Okay, next. Letter K is an obligation of Dumaguete. So it says Dumaguete will adopt all proper measures to enable the PSP to hire and engage foreign personnel. And we know this because this is China's business model. They have big projects. They bring in their own technical people so that uh, you know, they can control the technology. They can control the communications, etc., etc. And we need to remember that during the term of the joint venture agreement, it is EM Cuerpo who will be managing the business. And we know in basic labor law that as manager, you also have the power to decide who to hire and who to fire. Yung trabaho o day-to-day work of a manager. Ko owner bitaw ta sa city, pero dili kita ang mag-manage. Sila ang mag okay. They also say that we're going to get taxes. Fine, we may get taxes later on after all the natural resources we have um, identified as potentially at risk um, have already been destroyed. But we agreed that we will waive all regulatory fees and local taxes for the construction of the project. Reclamation alone will take at least three years. After that, this company will still build other components of the project, therefore prolonging the time where we have waived all regulatory fees and local taxes. So again, my question, ano sa pamanta mag-earn ani? Okay? The city share, we can charge real property taxes. But what if we go to court, challenge that provision, and they lose? And so this particular company will just say, I lease na lang, developer's rights na lang. 
can we really tax real property taxes to a non-owner? No, we cannot. Okay. And so, ladies and gentlemen, these are a few of my slides because I have run over time and I apologize to the organizers. These people on the board are those who have voted to actually authorize uh, the mayor to sign the contract. Okay. Now, what we need to do now, because we're do, where do Maguete City, is to reach out to as many of these people as possible to really encourage them to think very close, very, very well, their future as professionals, as leaders of the city, because the legal risk increases every day. Okay, um, Attorney Carissa Valentino Maxino is vice mayor. She doesn't have a vote, but if this comes to a tie, she has a critical uh, break the tie vote. So we need. We also need to give them correct, verifiable information, and that's why I've been working so hard. Um, to really invite all the experts to give them the kind of information that they need because I care for these people. Uh, some of these people are my colleagues, some of these people are my students, um, some of them are friends of my father. So this is not like your typical away in the Manila activista go, go, go. This is also about community. So I'm always asked, what else can we do? And I always tell people, this is the fight for our home and a fight for our children, a fight for my one-year-old who's giggling outside my door right now. And so we need to find the face of our protest. It will be beautiful, it will be strong, and it will carry Dumaguete with faith, love, and courage. Thank you, everyone, and I hope you continue to fight for our home. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Golda. Uh, that was a very uh, comprehensive overview. And uh, I'm sure that uh, even those who had not been following or maybe have missed out on some details um, was able to glean at least the, the essence of the issues. Uh, we appreciate that you have given a basis for development goals because uh, I think one of the louder um, counters to 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 the to the nose is that you know you're anti-development, like you said. But then there are um, bases that we can we can use uh, to guide our decisions in terms of development. You also gave ideas um, taken from the comprehensive development plan of the mayor himself. So thank you for presenting that. Uh, now we have some questions here that I will be reading. Um, they, they've been sent in advance uh, from our Facebook page and there are also new questions. I will go through them one by one and maybe ask some follow-ups. Okay, let's start with the first one. Can we ask help from PRRD, President Duterte? I don't know. I don't know President Duterte, <laughs> but if you do, maybe he'll help. He's been quite he's been quite supportive of the reclamations in Manila. Uh, mm. But ask if you have contacts. Uh, if you feel that in the halls of power there are people that can help do Maguete, do ask them. Uh, make sure that, that it's just aligned with your values. Um, out of full disclosure, I don't like President Duterte, so I'm not going to ask help. Um, from him because I also believe that the strength and heart of the Dumaguete people um, will be enough uh, for this fight, but the love of the entire country and the world will carry us through. So. All right, thank you. Uh, I, I think I, I appreciated what you said that, you know, this is about community and ultimately even the discussions that we're having, um, they're amongst people we know uh, people we we grew up with and uh, and you know have have had contact with in some form or way and so um, we would really appreciate um, you know good discourse at least uh, an intelligent exchange of ideas and hopefully uh, and and a way to enlighten each other. Uh, okay, so there are other questions here um, asking about what are the other legal remedies we can use to override the decision of the council or bar the implementation of such project? Okay, there are several. So 
I'm going to run through them. First, the court-based or the judicial uh, mechanism. So we are exploring writ of kalikasan. So writ of kalikasan, there's two broad uh, goals, broad grounds. One is if our constitutional right to a balanced and healthful ecology is violated, it's critical that we are we are really present and evidence already that the contract is signed or that there's already um, some level of damage. So, so the, the bar is quite high and that's why we're studying it very closely because we have seen a lot of communities also actually succeed in getting a writ of kalikasan. The second ground is when you're threatened with a violation, uh, threatened with violation by an unlawful act uh, on the part of a public official, in this case, our public officials um, involving environmental damage that will prejudice our life, health, and properties. It's quite high also, the threshold, so that's one. Of course, mm. another one is getting an injunction. So there are groups of lawyers already that are ready as soon as this MOU, which is actually a joint venture agreement, is signed, that they're immediately going to court and going to ask for um, an injunction if the city is also not going to present the documents yet. Um, they're also going to ask for the documents through uh, mandamus and prohibition and all these other uh, remedies. Um, there is a remedy that will not stop the project, but I think it's also important to mention, and that is filing cases under the Anti-Graft and Corrupt Practices Act. There are also legal remedies that are not judicial based. So I've heard a lot and I've been in conversations, very interesting, great discussions on what we call the local initiative. So Unsamani, it's when 1,000 registered voters of a city will file a petition in the Sangunian for the purpose of directly proposing, enacting, or amending an ordinance. It's an exciting legal remedy because it has not been tested quite well. Yeah. So Murag, it's a dare in the law. It's very, it's a very good provision. It has not been used extensively. So what is essentially is this will do is that the people themselves will pass an ordinance. So what kind of ordinance? We could say an ordinance that I don't know uh, prohibits reclamation. Period. Massive. And if you win that, uh, we can essentially stop this um, contract. The only thing is we also have to be very realistic. The time period is quite long. So uh, the people need to uh, send it to the Sangunian. If they if they do not act on it in 30 days, then then we go. Through, we have 90 days to collect signatures. We have to work with Comelec because Comelec will be managing this. So it's quite. There's a lot of moving pieces, but that's also a possibility. So non-judicial and but I hope that the city council members, especially those who voted uh, to support the mayor's mission will not let it come to this because local initiative in this form with this context is like a slap on their faces mm. it's like telling them the registered voters of Dumaguete are so fed up with you you're not doing your job so we're gonna present an ordinance that will essentially do your job and we don't want that um, right. this is about the community yeah so th th these are the legal options again Please be reminded that this video does not reflect on any opinion from the DC team and is only published for information purposes. Thank you for watching. If you found this video informative, please leave a comment in the section below. Subscribe to our channel and click on the notification bell so you won't miss any of our upcoming videos.